Welcome to FinScale, a podcast created by Solen Niederkorn, shedding light on innovation in finance, banking, and insurance. World Bank Mysteries Unveiled. Andrea Monteleon, Senior Payments Expert at the World Bank. The Western Balkans economies, both the authorities and the market participants with, with best practices from around the world. We have involved payment systems operators, regulators, major banking groups from the European Union to come to our events and share their strategies, the challenges they faced, and how they developed digital payment solutions to serve their, uh, their customer bases. In the same way that I greatly enjoyed hosting the EIF, a deputy and a finance minister, I'm delighted this week to understand the role played by the World Bank in the digitalization and modernization of financial systems in emerging countries. Together with Andrea, we explore the example of instant payments and examine the role played by the World Bank in this implementation, particularly through the practical case of their deployment in the Western Balkans. This sheds light on the historic institution based in Washington, D.C., and it's a great way to understand the nature of their collaborations with both public and private sectors. You will understand concretely how the World Bank assists developing economies worldwide in modernizing payment systems and the financial sector in general. By partnering with policymakers and the private sectors, it develops a new playbook to drive impactful and resilient development. Modernizing the financial sector is just one aspect of it, as the World Bank has already been supporting more than 12,000 development projects, including infrastructures, schools and roads. Enjoy the show! Hello everyone, hi Andrea. Hi Solène, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to have you on, on the podcast um, because I already received great guests from uh, European institutions like the European Investment Fund or the European Investment Bank, qualitative content um, from those actors and players. But I think that the World Bank is an institution that people don't really know. And in the domain of digitalization of the financial sector across the world is also a big question mark for many of my listeners. So could you please start by quickly introduce yourself and tell a little bit about your background and what you're doing at uh, the World Bank and then we'll dig into it. Sure. So first of all, let me say that since I discovered your podcast, uh, I became a fan, at least of the episodes in English. So it's a pleasure to be part of one of your episodes. And uh, what about me? I'm Andrea Monteleone. I'm an expert in payments. I'm an Italian based in Washington, D.C. I moved uh, here a couple of years ago to join the Payment System Development Group of the World Bank. Uh, my job, the, the, the job of our team is to assist uh, developing economies around the world to modernize their uh, national payment system, leveraging uh, the innovation that is uh, reshaping uh, at a pretty high pace the financial sector. Prior to that, I was uh, with MasterCard in Europe where I held different roles. I have been both a management consultant for both internal consultancy to MasterCard against or towards uh, major forces that were reshaping payments in Europe, like uh, PST2 or the advent of uh, instant payments in Europe, uh, and for uh, major banking groups. And at MasterCard, I also held uh, uh, roles in product management. I was uh, in charge of the digital consumer solutions of MasterCard in Europe. So I would define myself uh, as a payment expert at this stage. Other than that, I know we share the passion for running. This is good because the development of uh, modern payment systems of digital payments often is a marathon, a beautiful race, but it's good to know how to run it. So glad to be here with you. To speak Great. Live. Yes, and the listeners don't realize, but we've been already spending minutes <laughs> talking about trail running uh, before recording the, the episode. Okay, so uh, Andrea, I guess the first question I would like to ask you is about uh, the World Bank. Can you please give us a brief overview and maybe explain to us what's the primary mission of the World Bank? Sure. So the uh, World Bank uh, is an international development organization with uh, 189 members from countries all around the world. Our mission is uh, 
to end extreme proper, uh, poverty and boost shared prosperity on a livable planet. And how we aim to achieve this mission is by partnering with all stakeholders, starting from uh, policymakers, authorities around the world, but also engaging with the private sector to write what we define a new playbook uh, uh, to drive uh, impactful development. How we at the World Bank define impactful de development uh, as a development that is inclusive, meaning that we do not leave anybody behind. We focus especially on the weakest segments of the population on addressing those gaps, like the rural gap or the gender gap that affect many countries around the world. We want development to be resilient, meaning that it can resist and navigate shocks, natural disasters, pandemics, crises of any sort. Lastly, we want development uh, uh, to be sustainable, meaning that it triggers and fosters uh, a truly 360 growth of the countries we support. Uh, so it generates an increase in human capital, for example, the creation of markets, uh, the increase uh, uh, of jobs, of new jobs in these markets. And uh, we work uh, with this approach uh, across uh, all major areas of development. For example, the team in Paro focuses on uh, modernizing the financial sector, but the World Bank is also active on, for example, building new schools or roads where they're needed or bringing clean water where a population does not have access to it or mm -hmm. uh, providing support to displaced population when uh, a tsunami comes, for example. So we truly believe we make an impact across all areas of development to give you a number if I'm not mistaken, we delivered 12,000 development projects around the world since the constitution of the World Bank. And we believe that our role is important and our mission is important because our primary clients are the developing countries of the world. And uh, these countries, if there was no player like the World Bank, would struggle to find uh, the assistance both in in terms of technical advisory and in terms of financial support that they need mm -hmm. to undertake uh, these development projects. Okay, interesting. And in what sense do you collaborate with, on one side, public sectors with other uh, supranational organizations such as European Investment Bank, central banks, government agencies, and on the other side, the private sectors? So those are completely different stakeholders. So how, what is the nature of those collaborations, public versus private? With uh, the public sector, our clients, uh, policymakers, authorities, uh, we do provide uh, technical advisory and financial support to design, develop, and implement development projects. We also uh, involve the private sector in, in these initiatives because often uh, the authorities are our entry point in a way in any jurisdiction, but then uh, our initiatives in most cases are large scope initiatives that involve an entire ecosystem. So we, through the authorities, connect uh, with the private sector. And it is a priority for us to crowd in the investment of the private sector to uh, foster the development of the private sector because it aligns to our mission. Then uh, I believe that we, in general, operate as a bridge because we bring together on the one side the policymakers uh, and the authorities, the international standard setting bodies, and on the other side, the private sector. In the case of my team, commercial banks, but also fintech or telcos, through a variety of, uh, of um, how can I call it, channels, uh, global convenings, communities of practices, event. And uh, we do so with the objective of uh, fostering collaboration, of uh, creating uh, that much needed platform uh, where a fair, open and inclusive dialogue can take place uh, to, to discuss together joint agendas for development on a variety, of a variety of topics and to align the interest of the private sector and the priorities of public policy. Mm -hmm. So um, you're from Europe, you're Italian, so you know um, instant payments. Uh, why are they so important for modern financial systems? How uh, fast payments can benefit uh, modern uh, financial systems, uh, I would say they can do on a variety of uh, levels. The first one is that fast payments uh, can support uh, a variety of payment uh, instruments. 
being them credit transfers or direct debits, for example. They can support a variety of uh, payment use cases and types. For example, the so-called person-to-person, uh, person-to-person flow of money, but also the B2B flow of money, but also the person to government or vice versa, government to person or businesses. This means that fast payments can bring that integration, that interoperability that oftentimes is lacking in financial systems. Another benefit of fast payments uh, is that they can be offered uh, not only by traditional players like commercial banks, uh, but also by new players, fintech, mobile money providers, challenger banks, new banks. And uh, this means that they can potentially open up a market and increase competition. And this comes at an obvious benefit uh, for the end users in terms of uh, innovation and uh, reduced costs. So better services at lower cost. This is an important aspect, especially in developing economies where oftentimes uh, financial services are very expensive to access for the population. And this brings me to another benefit, fast payments uh, being digital by nature can uh, smoothly incorporate what we call overlay services, which are services that could be financial or non-financial in uh, in their content that are built, uh, I would say, on top of and around the core payment service. Here I'm referring, for example, to the use of uh, QR codes to simplify the user experience mm-hmm. uh, of initiating a transaction. But I'm also referring to what is called request to pay. So for example, the service through which a business can incorporate an invoice adding transparency to a transaction. Obviously, this benefits the use of overlay service services facilitate the adoption of uh, digital payments, mm-hmm. which mean uh, digitalization of the economy, less reliance on cash, formalization, so broader, uh, the adoption of fast payments truly can spark broader benefits for for an economy, for a financial system. And uh, if we are talking now about theory, let me give you two practical examples, Brazil and and Thailand. In the case of Brazil, the uh, central bank, Banco Central do Brazil, uh, launched the PIX, a fast payment system that in one year of operations outpaced all other payment solutions available in the market. And today, nine businesses out of 10 in Brazil accept uh, rely on PIX to accept payments. And uh, if uh, you know the context of Brazil, you can imagine that uh, out of these now nine out of 10 businesses, sorry for the game of words, some are micro merchants, individual entrepreneurs that literally sell their goods on the streets, for example. For them, fast payments meant starting to accept electronic payments while while simply they could not before. So Mm -hmm. it was transformative. It was a paradigm change for for the economy of Brazil. I mentioned also Thailand. Thailand is the first country in the world in terms of instant payment transactions per capita. In Thailand, the fast payment system is called prompt pay. Uh, ACI Worldwide estimates that from pay and in general instant payments in Thailand will uh, generate an additional uh, economic output equal to 2% of the GDP of the country, of the estimated GDP of Thailand in 2026. And this additional uh, uh, value is driven by the cost savings that merchants can access by the share of the economy that is uh, uh, formalized by the adoption by payers and pays of digital payments. So these are material examples on the impact that past payments can produce on an economy, on a mm-hmm. financial system. And the different stakeholders you're in contact with in each country uh, differs or is it the same entry point? So typically our client is represented by uh, uh, the authority. So in the context of payments, this would be the central bank. Then, depending on what uh, the very content of the project in a country, we uh, can engage with different stakeholders. So, for example, in some markets, uh, we work uh, also with the entire ecosystem of what uh, are defined payment service providers. Mm -hmm. So, basically, the providers of payment services, banks and fintech, where these are available to are uh, allowed to offer payment services. In other countries, we can also work, for example, with other government agencies because we want to 
deploy financial education initiatives to help the population, both of consumers and merchants, to increase the adoption of, of digital payments. And what I can say in this context is that even if fast payments could either be publicly owned or privately owned, meaning that we have observed both models in the world, uh, we believe that it is uh, right for the central bank, which is our direct client, typically to take a steering role because the central bank is in the position, for example, to partner with an organization with the World Bank to facilitate the knowledge sharing with, uh, with the best practices uh, from different jurisdictions. Is it a position to promote and, uh, let me say, push the participation and commitment of the private sector, and it can also align the priorities of uh, financial policy with uh, with the objectives that could differ to some extent, and mm-hmm. this is natural of the private sector. So I had in mind a, a use case uh, that is available on your website about the Western Balkans modernization and the integration of of payment systems in this region. I don't know if you've been working on the, this interesting use case, but I would be interested to know the different challenges that developing countries usually face when adopting fast payment among central banks, commercial banks and fintech companies. What are the different complexities of these uh, implementation projects? So I would say that the Western Balkans modernization project is a good example in this regard. The uh, development of uh, uh, domestic fast payment infrastructure is just one leg of that project because that is a truly comprehensive initiative, I would say. It involves uh, the Western Balkan six, so Albania, Bosnia, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Montenegro and Serbia, because they represent a region which is integrated. And this is indeed one of the important characteristics of, the, of this project. The challenges that they face is that these economies are still not fully digitalized at a domestic level. And even if the ties between these countries are strong, the economies are not integrated as they could be. And since payments do represent the backbone, of any economy, we believe that payments could be the tool to pursue a greater level of integration between these economies. In terms of challenges that these countries are facing, uh, the first one I would say uh, uh, is these countries are, let's say, are facing high costs of payments because of the lack, again, of interoperability, of integration between the economies. Consider that For uh, micro, small and medium businesses in the Western Balkans, uh, for intra-region trade, it could be uh, six times as expensive as it is for their peers in the European Union to trade uh, with each other. These countries also face uh, huge challenges uh, in terms of, uh, uh, for example, the cost of remittances. Uh, uh, Remittances are basically the funds transferred on by diaspora, by people who leave their countries Mm -hmm. to find a job and send money home. The Western Balkans are a region where there were in 2022, 12 billion of inflow of US dollars of inflow remittances. These remittances are expensive in the Western Balkans, well above the target set by the United Nations. And we want these countries to reduce these costs. The, the Western Balkans also face a gap in terms of financial inclusion compared to the European Union, which is the, I would say, the benchmark that we want to bring the region towards. Mm-hmm. And uh, we are working with the project to address these challenges. Uh, it's obvious, as you uh, were uh, mentioning, that there are challenges faced by the market players and by the policymakers in how to tackle the project. Because on the one side, we work uh, with, the, with the authorities, for example, to update the regulation under the, um, the, the project in the Western Balkans. We are helping authorities uh, adopting the national payment laws and regula- regulations, uh, the uh, uh, articles of the PST2 and the requirements uh, uh, for joining SEPA, the single European payment area. And we are also working with the authorities to develop fast payment infrastructures. Mm-hmm. On the other side, the big challenge is that a market needs to adopt this. So banks and fintech need to comply with updated regulations, and this comes with complexities for them. But countries also need to 
efficiently and smoothly and that value for them to connect to a fast payment infrastructure in order to develop and offer fast payment services. How do we help both sides of the market, the public and the private, to address these challenges uh, through the project we created a platform which in practice takes the form of uh, events or workshops of panels where we involve all payment service providers in the market because this is very important to have everybody sitting at the same table and being given an opportunity to present the challenges they face, the needs that they have, the constraints that they have. And uh, through this platform, uh, central banks typically share the plan the progress, for example, in adopting SEPA requirements. But uh, uh, on the other side, uh, uh, the uh, private sector can raise challenges. They give you, can, can raise, sorry, uh, questions. They give you a practical example. I mentioned QR codes. For QR codes to succeed, it's important to have a national standard. It's important that all different players use the same standards so that I can pay with my mobile banking app at merchants relying on different banks. This is something that can only be solved through the collaboration, through the uh, partnership that we try to facilitate and foster through the project. And another way that we are using to tackle these challenges is that we are connecting the Western Balkans economies, both the authorities and the market participants with, with best practices from around the world. We have involved payment systems operators, regulators, major banking groups from the European Union to come to our events mm -hmm. and share their strategies, their uh, the challenges they faced, and how they developed digital payment solutions to serve their uh, their customer bases. Okay, Andrea, one last question about, um, I mean, uh, when we look into the future in my crystal bowl, I see many, many <laughs> new initiatives like CBDCs and things like that. So um, can you say um, a few words uh, about this and tell us if uh, you uh, work in that uh, direction? Sure. So we uh, see uh, the same future where uh, innovation in the financial sector will bring uh, significant evolution. I would say that we at the World Bank also consider ourselves a knowledge bank, meaning that uh, it is a core component of our business to uh, advance and bring one step further every day the frontier of knowledge on payments in my case, on, uh, on uh, the financial sector in general for the global practice I'm part of. And in this perspective, for example, we are exploring a variety of topics that are uh, that are indeed reshaping uh, the financial industry. I can mention innovation in the context of retail payments, for example, the uh, advent of uh, buy now, pay later solutions that are surging around the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can also mention uh, the increasing number of uh, open banking and open finance frameworks that countries around the world are, are, are developing and adopting and their interplay with, uh, with digital payments is uh, a key area of focus for us. But I can also mention, for example, uh, CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currencies. This uh, is something that the vast majority of uh, central banks around the world are exploring today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for different reasons. Uh, we have produced, for example, a white paper on this, uh, where we worked uh, also with uh, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlement uh, Settlements, and we have interviewed a variety of policymakers at advanced stages of exploration of CBDC to understand what the opportunities are, what the models to deploy these uh, uh, these solutions could be, and what also the implications, for example, from a legal regulatory risk standpoint, could be for mm -hmm. the economy where these are introduced. This uh, for payments or so for what they focus on uh, is an important topic and specifically for fast payments because the interplay between fast payments and uh, and uh, and CBDC and crypto is a, is a, is an important focus mm -hmm. of the conversation today some perspectives are that they are alternative to each other our perspective is that there are synergies to pursue Mm -hmm. And therefore, we uh, plan on uh, expanding further the research on this on our end. Thank you, Andrea, for these clarifications. 
what book would you recommend to me and to the uh, uh, listeners uh, to conclude? Look, I have this on my desk right now. I don't know if I have... Show me. <laughs> by chance. But it's all, this is Atomic Habits. Ah, okay. A classic it's, one. It's not, it's not an industry book, though. <laughs> I, it tells more about me, I guess. Than yeah, but I, did you finish the book? I did finish the book and I see uh, many applications. Uh, I would say now maybe I'm stretching it <laughs> too much, but I see that our lesson, the lesson at least for me, is that the uh, development of financial sectors take time, but you build it one step at a time in an atomic perspective, uh, <laughs> if you want. And, uh, and, um, and this could... Uh, and this is the key, long-term commitment, uh, partnerships uh, uh, across all stakeholders. Uh, this is what is required. Big things take time to, to achieve, uh, but commitment uh, is the key. So that I would say. Thank you very much. It no, it's, it's perfect. I love the, that book. Thank you very much, Andrea. And uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Thank you all for listening and sharing this moment with us. Don't hesitate to contact me on Twitter or LinkedIn to share your comments and reactions. You can also rate this episode on your favorite podcast platform. See you soon. 